I'm really honored to be one of the only two Chinese speakers in real specific. All these con conferences held in Taiwan, but not too much Chinese speaker. So today I'm going to give a talk about uh, server infrastructure for rails in 2016. Uh, this title looks a bit of boring, to be honest. <laughs> in 2016, you know, every time I put an ear into my speak title, I feel like, well, okay, so in next year that this slide is no longer useful. But uh, since I have some chance to talk with some Ruby and Rails friends about their work and how, how they feel when they learn Rails, and many people complain about when they uh, finish their Rails code and want to put it online and feel quite, you know, confused and really panic about uh, putting their Rails code to real-world servers. So uh, we have a conclusion that uh, writing Rails is fun, but running Rails is hard. Comparing to, comparing to, I, I even have a ch conversation with my friends that I say, hey, come on, you write a lot of Rails project, but why you don't use Rails in work? Uh, and I say, uh, because my boss didn't know. And my boss asked me about why we could just upload it and it will run automatically, like just, you know, set up an Apache server plus PHP, you know, just put the PHP files via FTP and it will run automatically. But anyway, so um, in this talk, I want to give you some new concept about uh, real server infrastructure that <coughs> and how, how you can improve it, your server infrastructure and make your rails runs faster. So let me in introduce myself. Uh, I'm Richard Lee. I work for iCook. Uh, iCook is just yet another recipe sharing website in this world using rails. Uh, but we basically fo focus on uh, Taiwanese market. So maybe uh, you cook uh, one day and you will probably find our recipe online. And uh, I am a developer, so I write Rails code since 10 years ago, and I also do some infrastructure stuff. So that's why I'm giving this talk. And uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter and GitHub. That's my username. Let's connect. And if you have any feedback of this talk, definitely please uh, mention me online or send me email or whatever. Let me know. So this is our website. Uh, we are recipe sharing platform, and user upload their recipe uh, using web, using uh, mobile native app. And our major, uh, our main revenue comes from some collaboration between uh, brand customer. So you can see there is some brands on <coughs> on the right side of our homepage. But most recipes are uh, still uh, social uh, community driven. So. Uh, what uh, an important job that in our company is to curate all this kind of recipe and put it into different category. Maybe this is a hot summer, <laughs> not so hard actually, but uh, people might want to have some ice cream, uh, mango ice, something like that. And so we need to uh, put it into the feature section and that users can assess it and see it uh, when they enter our website. Okay, so this is my company. <laughs> Then, and we have some challenge, just like uh, every other company does. Uh, running a business is really hard, despite all this technical challenge. Our main business challenge is that uh, because we have different kind of uh, small apps, uh, we have a main website, it's a social recipe sharing platform, but at the same time, we have an e-commerce website, we have a video website that, because for cooking, uh, you, can, you, can, you can understand that if you only follow the text and image, it's hard to see the idea how you could put, for for, for instance, you, you want to put an ingredient, when, when should it be added to your pot or something? So uh, in video, using video format is better to understand. So we have a several, separate website that is called iCook TV, and uh, we have an e-commerce website called iCook Market. We have several, <coughs> this kind of small website. And we try to separate it uh, into several Rails projects instead of putting it into a big monolithic, uh, big app. So uh, one challenge we have is that we have many developers that they develop a lot of uh, small projects and they want to put it online quick and fast. And also uh, development environment becomes more complex. Just you can see in the last talk, there is NPN start. You, you have NPN start from 
always have a node.js stuff. Sometimes I think it's a bit of confusing. For example, how many of you have tried any, you know, NPN or Bower thing that, <coughs> for example, if you want to install jQuery via uh, Bower, first of all, you need to install node.js, and you use NPN to install Bower, then you use Bower to install jQuery. That sounds, that sounds quite stupid, but, Anyway, uh, in, in real world, you might probably need that because several package, packages are only available via certain package management system. So, yeah, so uh, not, not, not mention put it online, even for our development environment. When I onboard a new uh, developer to our project, I would say, oh, first of all, you need to install Ruby specific version and you need to install Node.js and set up your database and set up lots of things. And some common libraries like ImageMagic, uh, LibXML, of course, need to be installed to our production server. So all this kind of thing make Rails a really complex program to run on your server. So uh, today's agenda, first I will introduce how to containerize your app. Many of you might probably hear about uh, some cool stuff, Docker, you know, it's a Docker era, everything is containerized. And yeah, we even have a uh, container submit in Taiwan, so it's quite popular now. And I will let you know how you can, you know, tweak your app to make it more container friendly. And then uh, I will share our experience while we are doing this process. That, uh, you know, uh, setting up container itself is a hard thing, but make it automatically and, and to make it automatic, automatic and building every time you push a commit and it build the image is another thing and it's some kind of hard and have some um, uh, we will share I will share my experience with it then and I will show how we do centralized logging and monitoring because we have several small apps so it's not possible that we you know just logging into every server and check the log file that doesn't make sense at all and then finally, I will show you some uh, recent improvement for Rails and maybe in Ruby ecosystem. Uh, talking about threaded environment, why you should adopt a threaded environment, make make your server perform more faster. So first thing uh, is containerize your app. So talking about container, many of you might just you know it's like equivalent to Docker, but not necessarily true. I think all of the Ruby or Rails developer I met use Heroku before, and because using Heroku is quite simple, we just add a git remote and git push, and it will be deployed and done. You you have a Rails app running on Heroku's cloud, and that actually also in container. So uh, I would say if you are uh, starting a new project for Rails, and you might probably use Heroku for your first deployment. And uh, yeah, you are already containerizing your app. So <laughs> not necessarily for Docker, but also for Heroku and maybe other container technologies. So is Docker stable yet? This is a common question that when I chat with my friends and they say, I hear that uh, Docker, there are some problem or whatever. Uh, but in my opinion, we have switched to a fully Docker environment. We run all our server, uh, we run all our apps on Docker. For I think it's like six months, <coughs> six months, and no too much trouble. Most trouble and most bugs are actually uh, encountered and <laughs> solved by others. So <laughs> thanks for their contribution. So uh, I could, I, I could certainly, I can certainly say that uh, yes, you can use Docker in production. Now it's a good time to get started. Yeah, many companies use it in production now. Not only I could, but also other big world company and you can see that from AWS to Google Cloud or even Heroku they provide certain support for Docker so I would say it's widely adopted and uh, a more stable technology right now so you can give it a try and uh, yeah they provide a really simple installation for Mac and Linux right now definitely for Linux it's easy because it's uh, based on some Linux kernel tweaks to make Container work, but on Mac, you might probably hear that to set up Docker on Mac is so troublesome. 
but they recently released a new project called Docker for Mac, uh, provide a simple package that you can install it, run it as a regular Mac app on your laptop, and it will immediately provide you a Docker command line interface that you can run any image on it, so it's super simple now. No, no, no more virtual box, no more Vagrant, all this kind of stuff, no more. So that's a good thing. And yeah, as I say, that major pass and I spend their support. Uh, if you use Heroku, I will recommend you to search something about Heroku's Docker support. And you can actually to rebuild a, like, like a Heroku-like environment on your laptop and put it online to production. And of course, tons of tutorials online, but uh, I, I need to say that when you when you see any Docker tutorial online, do uh, look at this Docker version because uh, Docker changes a lot in recent years. So like Docker 1.8 is a major update and bringing many new features. So uh, if you read, uh, actually when I was uh, <coughs> writing this slides, I also found that <laughs> Uh, in, in the next chapter, I will talk about our uh, experience with building Docker image on uh, continuous integration server, but those problems are already solved, so do, do check the version when you read any tutorials online. So uh, I'm not sure how many of you have uh, experience with Docker, so I still try to introduce Docker in uh, you know, 101 way, like to keep it simple. So actually Docker is just like building, you know, uh, we usually say that writing Rails code to build web app is quite simple because you have a lot of uh, gens available online. If you want user authentication, you can choose between device, choose between auth logic, many good libraries. And Docker share a sim <coughs> a Docker has a really strong community that uh, they share many pre-built images. It's called base image. For example, Docker Official provides Ruby image that has, uh, it's a, I, I think it's a Ubuntu image with uh, Ruby building and some uh, common libraries. And you can actually find some really good base image made by like the Fusion, uh, the creator of Passenger Web Server. They released a series of good base image that you can use. And uh, so you can choose from many pre-built base image then after you choose a preview uh, base image, then you add your file and run some Linux commands on it, like you want to app get install image magic, you want to install node.js, you want to install whatever you like, and you can add your Rails project into it, and then do bundle install, do something else. Then finally, just run it, then you can docker run, and you just get it up and running. So it's more, much more like, uh, compared to the old techniques to build a virtual machine image, it shares many similarity between building a virtual, I mean, uh, virtual, uh, like, previously you might probably build images for AWS, build image for virtual box, those kind of uh, virtualization thing, and this container is, uh, a bit of different. For virtualization, usually you build an image for whole system, but for container, you usually build for one process. Say, for example, that like this container, the only, the only single important problem of this container is to run my Rails app. So I choose from a good base image, then I add my Rails project and specify what it needs to be to be done, say for example, you need to bundle in store before you can run your real server. And specify those commands in your Docker file, then run it, <laughs> that's it. So uh, let me show you a simple config. I'm not quite sure if it's clear enough. If you couldn't see it, please raise your hand. And so in the first line, I say from Ruby 2.3.1, that means that I use this base image, which has Ruby 2.3. 2.3 pre-installed on the Docker image. Then, and I do some command like uh, app get update and run build essential, run libpg, run node.js, add something I need. And then I, I create a directory and then I add my gen file, do bundle install. After bundle install, I add the rest of my project file into it. 
they found it run it uh, around bundle rails <coughs> rails server so that's it that's a simple uh, minimal docker setup you can actually use it uh, our our real world case looks quite similar to this one we add something more but generally speaking just choose a pre-built image then add your project file then install something that you need and run bundle command and, oh I forgot it you need to uh, maybe do SS3 compile okay then finally specify what it <laughs> specify the command that you need to run so finally this docker image uh, is done so lots of tutorial online so I will skip that for some details but just give you a rough concept and how it looks like but uh, thanks Oh, oh, always when you read something about uh, some tutorials online, everything seems so simple, and that means there is some real problem behind. So if you read, uh, I'm not quite sure how many of you have read this, this 12 factor apps, uh, which proposed by Heroku co-founder and say, uh, stating that how a good web app in modern era should be, and they have some certain principle uh, for example that uh, you need to use environment configuration that you means that you you don't write all this configuration into your file system but instead you can tweak config using environment variable or well, there are several principles that they recommend to build a good web app so in container era let the same principle still apply for example, a good container should look like first self-contained. For example, uh, if you have uh, uh, assets, definitely, of course, air, most Rails app has SS pipeline, and you have some JavaScript, you have some style sheet, and uh, instead of uploading to somewhere else, like you can probably using uh, Ruby gems like SS Sync uh, to upload all this style sheet pre-compiled to S3 or CDN, uh, you should actually put it into the container because that when you have some trouble with your app, you can just switch and rolling back using the legacy version of uh, your container and put it online. You don't have uh, you know two different uh, versions online. You have so try to put all the assets, everything into the single image. Then second, you need to run one process per container. Say, for example, uh, in common Rails app, you might probably have background worker using active job, using sidekick, or using other background processor. Then uh, one way to do that is that you can run your Docker container with two processes in it. One is real server, one is sidekick. But instead, uh, I would suggest that you to run the same image, but as two container send image two instance and one is for rail server one is for your psychic process okay so what one, one process per container then also store config in environments just like you might probably have some experience with Heroku there is a simple command called uh, EMV files that you can <coughs> set environment variables when you are run any docker container and also, if you want to do some admin process on Heroku, we might probably use Heroku run console to open up a Rails console on Heroku server. And in Docker, there is no, I mean, uh, you can write some shell script, but basically it's still like Docker run and do something. And we use a simple shell script called ECS run shell. Uh, ECS means uh, Elastic Container Service. It's a service provided by AWS because we put all our Docker images on ECS. But anyway, you can run it using uh, in a separate admin process. And fortunately enough that uh, Heroku folks make many contributions to Rails 5. So Rails 5 is actually container ready. Uh, they enable, they add several environment variables to tweak default behavior. For example, that after Rails 4.1, you no longer need a database.yaml. You can actually put your database configuration in an environment variable called database URL. And I highly recommend it. 
And also, uh, there is an environment variable called uh, real serve static file, just as I said before. A good container should be self-contained. So uh, you you might probably also want to serve a static file from right from your Rails web process. And uh, in Rails file, you can just simply add this environment variable to set it to true, and it will your Rails project will start serve static files. And also another good, and and another good thing uh, in Rails file is that there's another environment variable called Rails log to standard output, because in Docker or in Heroku, if you want to collect log from uh, your container, the only I wouldn't say the only, but the recommended way is you just write your log into standard output and your container scheduler system will capture all this log and put it somewhere else. I will cover it later in centralized logging part. So Rails 5 is container ready. So Turon Donri, uh, if you haven't had a chance to use Docker in production, if you don't really plan to use it, in near future, but you still, I still recommend you to make your app container ready. If you have config file at this moment, you can probably want to switch it, switch it to use environment variable. Okay, so then, um, so okay, I, I talk a lot of a good thing about Docker and show you how you can use Docker to make a trail factor app. Then the real world issue is that. How I could build image in my CI or CD flow means that wherever I push a commit, someone should help me to build a Docker image. And actually, building Docker image takes some time, takes so much time. <laughs> so our first try, and first try because we used Circle CI, so uh, in Circle CI, and uh, we we just simply add a another command to do Docker image building, but uh, unfortunately, uh, before we add Docker image building to Circle CI testing, it's only take you know, less than five minutes to finish all our aspect tests, but after that, it takes 15 minutes and even more to build the Docker image, and you know, that's not tolerable in our, our, our case. We want, we, we, we want our CI text to run within 10 minutes. So what's what's happened? Because Docker has a lot of cache mechanics, and it should be fast. If you try it on your laptop, the first view might probably take much longer time, but the second view or third view, and if you don't change too much file, they will just use the cache file, and it will be super super fast. So what's happening? So why Docker cache fails on CI service, public CI service? Because that for Docker image cache work. It actually takes uh, file metadata into account to, 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 to compute a hash, to compute a digest, to see if file change or modified. So uh, it takes certain metadata, and one significant one is M time, which means the file, when the file was modified. And uh, Git doesn't track M time, so it's actually new to me that when you get clone a new project, you look after its uh, daytime of those file, you will see that uh, they, it just doesn't it, it ignore all this date or time or when this file is modified, all this attribute. So when you commit and get a file to get in, wouldn't track this kind of attribute. But however, this is fixed in Docker 1.8. That in Docker 1.8, uh, to compute the file digest, to compute the hash, uh, it no longer take M time into account. So this is no longer a problem. But however, uh, for a certain package management system, especially one in JavaScript world, <laughs> they sometimes when you do npm install twice, or maybe three times or whatever. Uh, every time you do npm install and it changes some files a bit, you do bool install and it changes the file a bit. So it will break Docker's cache. Also package, man package management system doesn't uh, work really well in this kind of cache environment. 
and Sprocket. Sprocket also has some cache, and if you use certain new regions, and it will generate just like just like load management management system does, that uh, it will randomly generate some cache file or whatever that will easily to break your Docker cache. So how we survive? So bring bring your own CI server. Actually, personally, I. If there is a paid service, a hosted solution, I will usually, usually choose a hosted solution like Circle CI or Travis CI. But uh, however, in this case, because in Circle CI or in other public CI service, between build to build, uh, your file are actually pull and download every time when a build starts. So, which means that the file system is not persistent. So, uh, but if you roll out your own CI server, definitely you will share the same file system between build to build. So there is no too much cache issues, uh, since all the files are persistent in your server. So, long story short, we use Junky plus Jenkins. Junky is a project open source by GitHub. It's just like a, it's like an API wrapper for Jenkins. Uh, for those who have tried Jenkins before, you will probably found it really hard to set up and to tweak per project setting. And Jenkins, yeah, to solve this problem, so GitHub folks, they created this project called Junkie. And Junkie provides a chat room interface that to install, you, you install a script in your Hubot, and you can say Hubot CI build something, Hubot CI do something, Hubot CI. Anyway, so, <coughs> and more importantly, for per project setting that you can add, just like using Circle CI or Travis CI, the configuration of the project building is put into repository. So usually I will put a script file in my Rails project and specify how, what steps need to be take, taken to build Docker image. And they provide a good user interface like this. You can see how it, how, how your Docker image build process looks like. So yeah, uh, so for this part, I would say uh, building a Docker image on your laptop is easy, but building it on CI service might be hard. So do care, do, do take care of those cache issues. Otherwise, you will spend lots of time building. Oh, by the way, you might probably hear that Docker official provide a service called Docker Hub. In Docker Hub, there is automatically building uh, solution, but we definitely tried that before, and that doesn't work. They have no cache at all, <laughs> so it takes too much time <laughs> when building an image, especially for reals. Like, if you build assets without any any cache, it takes usually it takes three to five minutes to build your assets. So that well, so roll out your own CI service is highly recommended. The next stuff I will talk about centralized logging and monitoring. Actually, more about logging. So since we are in a container era, so um, probably I will have multiple server run different kind of apps. So uh, I need to have a way to pipe all this log string into the same single place. And so I'm going to talk about FluentD. FluentD is a Ruby project and we have some native extension. Uh, for performance, and uh, so for Ruby, for Ruby guys just like you and me might probably be quite comfortable with FluentD's config. You can even write your own plugins. Uh, I, I create one for my my for for a certain use case. So I, I can say that it only takes me one day or two day to to survey and try to write my own plugin. It's quite easy. So uh, what it actually does is that uh, before FluentD, you might probably see different kind of log from different era. You might probably have web access log from, maybe you have some operation logs from AWS, from Heroku, you use different part of service, and you want to put it into several places, and you want to put it into Hadoop, you want to put it into S3, and it will look like a mess. And using FluentD, it's just simple as Unix pipe. I, was a, I really like Unix file pipe, that you can pipe one command to another command. And the, this philosophy is just for that FluentD. And 
So in FluentD, you have a lot of input plugin that collect logs from several different places. And then in FluentD itself, you can do some filtering, do some modification, maybe you want to do some parsing stuff or filtering out certain logs, maybe it's too sensitive or something, and then put it into several different output. Uh, you might probably want to store data in your MongoDB cluster, store data into Amazon. Okay, so it just make everything looks <coughs> much better. Huh? So, and uh, more importantly, that FluentD works so well with Docker that in Docker 1.8, there is a building, uh, there is a building logging driver for FluentD, which means that, as I mentioned before, that a good container should put to should output its logs uh, via standard output. And uh, using Docker 1.8, uh, it could actually collect uh, your log from your container, then put it into your FluentD cluster and do all this pipe pipeline thing that put in and uh, downstream your logs to somewhere you like. So how we make our log from Rails to FluentD? And first of all, uh, I will recommend you to use gems like Log Rage or Log Stasher, which make your log beautifully format into a single line JSON format. If you haven't heard of it, you haven't tried it, I will suggest you to check it out. Uh, what it does is actually, usually in the default Rails production log, uh, a single request will generate like five or six lines of logs, and one talking about is HTTP request, what is pass, and what which controller, and what views was rendered. Okay, so, but in uh, using log rage or log stature, this kind of solution could make you your log in combined into a single line. So every one request has a one line of log. Then you output it to standard output. Using Rails file, you just tweak an environment variable to put it, to, to make it uh, right to standard output. Then after that, when you run Docker command, you can use uh, an option called the log driver equals fluentd. Then you probably want to tweak some fluent setting. Uh, like for example, you want to tag Tag, tag in FluentD is like name your string, name your log, okay? So how did you name this log in FluentD? So you add some Fluent tag and run the image, and it will automatically collect your log from standard output of your Rails project to FluentD cluster. So that's it. That is quite simple to collect logs from Rails to FluentD. And uh, in FluentD, and you can actually find many configuration files online. They have cookbooks for uh, for how to put your log data from <coughs> from Rails to Elasticsearch or from other place. And I will share our experience. The recommended approach is to first of all to pipe all your logs into FluentD. If you're using Docker, that will be quite simple because. Just make your Docker image to write everything into standard output and do the configuration that make your container to output to standard output. And after that, you collect your logs into FluentD via FluentD driver. Then second, you might probably add some minimal variable output. Uh, for those who first time do this kind of thing, just like me in maybe one years before, the the most common problem is that which kind of output should I use? Should I put it into S3? Should I put it into whatever, somewhere else? But uh, I would say the most simple one is you choose three. Uh, three, three kinds of output. First, you want to do archiving because you want to store all your log in a place that you can, you know, maybe one year, I wouldn't say one year, like a few months later, you want to go back and find out what happening at that time. So first, you might probably store it into S3. Then you want to have a query interface, which is easier for developers or for your operation people that could find some logs from that. Then you might probably use Elasticsearch plus Kibana. Oh, that's a quite common and popular solution. And for data analytics, you for in our case, we want to know what users search 
because uh, search search recipe is a quite a common use case in our com in, in, in our website. Many people they search what they want to cook every day. So I want to have a place to do data analytics, and you might probably use AWS Redshift, uh, or we use Treasure Data. Treasure Data is the company who actually created FluentD and all these open source projects, and they provide really good Hadoop hosted Hadoop service with good Presto and all this query interface and very nice. So this is how our log system looks like. And we use FluentD from copy data from Docker and pipe via different fluentD fluent server and finally pipe into Treasure Data's query interface. And there's uh, several roles there are actually access log from our Rails application. So that's how you can build your simple centralized working system. So the last thing I want to talk about is server performance tuning. This is a huge topic, so I wouldn't talk too much because every app has different use case and scenario, but the general rules of some of in 2016 is that you use a threaded server. Is real safe, uh, is real straight safe yet? Uh, I would say, uh, yes, uh, because it syncs Rails 2, Rails 3, Rails 4 every time a major Rails upgrade, someone, you know, someone will probably ask, okay, so is Rails 3 safe yet? And I would say yes, actually, uh, we have been using uh, threaded server for like, four years and use background process workers like Psychic uh, or other threaded solution for your Rails app for years and everything runs smoothly, not too much trouble for trace. But so you can actually see some major uh, performance boost uh, using Threaded Server, for example, like Sidekick versus Delay Job or Rescue. Uh, you might probably hear about Delay Job and Rescue, but they use a single one process model which only handle one task per process. But using Sidekick, you can handle 25 or even more jobs in a single process. That's much more efficient. And for web server, uh, there are several solutions. One is Puma, one another is Passenger. Passenger in recent release, they have uh, good straight more support. And if you use Unicorn, you might probably want to use Rambos. Rambos is uh, like fork of uh, Unicorn that add some straight into uh, pure Unicorn web server. So there's a good article called Trends in Ruby, analyzing Ruby gen states for 2015. And you can see for X server that uh, Puma actually, uh, more and more users are using Puma or Thing, both of them are more concurrent, uh, can, can handle more requests at the same time. And for background workers, you can see sidekicks just wow, fry, fry it up. So I would say uh, a threaded environment is quite stable in nowadays. And also for Heroku, previously, they, uh, maybe in the first few years of Heroku, they recommend you to use Unicorn. But uh, in last year, they start to recommend users to use Puma. And not to mention in Rails 5, the default web server becomes Puma and drops web brick and use Puma. So uh, for <coughs> the reason, I would say, uh, for instance, if you stop, you create a new Rails 5 project and you run Rails server, by default, you use Puma. And uh, they also provide a default Puma .rb config, config, okay, it's a <laughs> simple. So uh, it provides a default Puma configuration file. And by default, it has uh, it uses a shredding mode. So, uh, by default, you have five uh, straight in the same process. So for those who isn't quite understand what's the difference between straight and process, and the general idea is that uh, uh, using multiple threads means that they share the same memory, and using several process means they don't share the same memory. So for certain cases that you might you, you might not want your different worker, different web requests handling using the same data. Otherwise, there might be data corruption or something. But if your program 
uh, is designed properly, you try to avoid this kind of you know shared memory usage, then that would be fine. So the problem is actually not rails. If if rails, if rails is straight safe yet, but the problem is that does does your app straight safe yet? So common threading issue when we migrating our service from Unicorn from Rescue to Puma to Sidekick. Uh, first of all, you try to avoid using class variable or global variable because all these variables say it's global, so it will be accessed from different thread. And if you change the value and do something uh, with it, and your app server might probably explode. Then another common issue is that uh, many gens are not actually not straight safe. Uh, I just named a few, but usually you can find a uh, work around for that, for example, in R maybe people use R magic for image manipulation, but instead you can use mini magic. And AWS, S AWS SDK provides a, a configuration that you can eager load all the class to avoid uh, load straight problems. All right, so that's summary. What, you what, what I want to tell you is certain some trends for real server infrastructure in this year. So first is that you should try to containerize your apps, no matter you are planning to use Docker or not. If you use Heroku, you are already run your Rails app in a container environment. Second, be careful about CI cache issues. Though this is more specific to uh, Circle CI and my use case, but generally speaking, if you want to use any container technologies, uh, do care to take care of CI cache issues. Then third, uh, you need to build your minimal viable centralized logging solution. If you use other, uh, if no matter you use FluentD or use other tools, uh, this is pretty important, and you should build it up. You should build, build up your own centralized logging system from day one. This is really important thing. Then adopt strays. Okay, so there's many terrible story how they when they migrate to straight server and things broke and explode. But that's not not that terrible. Okay, it's already quite stable yet. So just use it. So finally, thank you. And oh, we are hiring. So if you want to find a job, just come and chat with me. Okay.